Olson, welcome to my YouTube channel. Tonight at Lean Product Meetup, I was excited to host my friend Nir Ayal. Nir is the author of the best-selling book, Hooked, and his new book, Indistractable, came out this week. So today he was sharing advice from this book. Um, we gave out copies to people, it was great. A lot of excitement, a lot of practical tips and tricks about how to maintain focus and avoid distraction in today's busy, crazy world. And so I think you're gonna enjoy it. There's also a lot of great Q&A that Nir did with the audience. So if you enjoy the video, be sure to like it and subscribe and also sign up for notifications so that you get notified when the next video gets posted. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you very much. Can we just give a warm round of applause for this guy? Is he awesome? These events are so much work and month after month you're making it happen. And can I tell you, so I moved to New York about two years ago. I used to live here uh, in San Francisco. And I gotta tell you, Dan is one of the reasons that, I, I'm gonna get choked up here, but you are one of the reasons that I really miss the Bay Area. Another reason I really miss the Bay Area is this. I mean, there's nowhere else in the world where you get my people all together, people who love helping people solve problems through the products that we are building. To, I know usually for these events, it's about how do we build better products, but today I wanna to talk about how do we build a better you? Because we've all noticed how distracted we've all become, right? Who's noticed how distracted we've become? Have you seen this? What are some of the common distractions? I'm just curious, let me just take a quick survey. Somebody tell me a source of distraction they find. Yeah, yeah, from in the back there, what do you, oh, that thing, right, he's holding up his phone, this. <laughs> Give me another, where else do we get distracted? Where, what, where, where do you find you struggle with distraction? Anybody else? Slack. Slack, huge source of distraction. Yeah, how about you? Mind. Your, your mind is distracting itself, interesting. What else? <laughs> Anybody else? The news, yeah, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, the, the, your boss, your kids. We are incredibly distracted these days. And my question is why? Why are we so distracted these days? And I think the, 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 the usual suspect are these technologies. And part of the reason is because the fact is that these technologies are designed to hook us. Uh, many of you, I, I, when I was signing books, many of you said you'd read my previous book, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. And so maybe it's worth kind of just setting the stage in how exactly do these products change our behavior? How do products get us hooked? Well, it's part, I, I didn't build the hook model at Facebook or Google or Instagram. I wasn't at those companies. But what I did do was to popularize the this deeper psychology around how these products get us hooked with the intention of democratizing those techniques, right? Facebook and the gaming companies, they've known these techniques for a very, very long time. What I wanted to do is to help everyone else use these same techniques for good. And so here's, here, let me give you the very quick 30,000 foot uh, overview of the hook model. The hook model says that to build a consumer habit, we start with a trigger. And there are two types of triggers, external triggers and internal triggers. The external triggers are the pings, dings, and rings, all of the things in our environment that prompt us to action. So let's say it's a Slack notification or a Facebook ping or ding or your phone you know, buzzing at you. That would be an example of an external trigger that prompts you to action. The action phase is the simplest thing done in anticipation of reward. Opening an app, scrolling your feed, checking a dashboard, pushing the play button on a video. The simplest thing done in anticipation of a reward. Then comes the reward phase of the hook. This is where the user's itch is scratched, where they get what they came for. And typically it comes in the form of what's called a variable reward. So there's some kind of uncertainty, some kind of mystery involved with what you might find when you engage with one of these products or services. Then comes the investment phase. The investment phase is where we put something into the product to make it better with use. It stores value the more we use it. So it's where we put data, content, followers, reputation, anything we do to make the product better and better with use. So that through successive cycles through these hooks, this is how uh, customer preferences are shaped, how our tastes are formed, and how these habits take hold. Now, I wrote this book, Hooked, almost exactly five years ago for two reasons. One, I wanted to democratize these techniques. I wanted everyone in the product development community to use these tactics for good. Right? It, why, why should it just be the gaming companies that know how to keep us engaged? We can use these very same tactics to help people form healthy habits. And that was always my intent with writing the book, and that's exactly what's happened. Thousands of companies have used the hook model to make their products more engaging. I'll give you a few examples. Kahoot. Anybody have school-age kids? I bet your kids are using Kahoot. It's the world's largest educational software. 
Uh, they went public recently, actually, and, and the, they get kids hooked to in-classroom learning. Companies like Fitbod, uh, as a, a, a couple folks here mentioned that they use, I wrote an article about them, that they use Fitbod, and uh, it is a great example of a product that helps people form a healthy habit of exercising in the gym. Paga has brought millions of previously unbanked people in sub-Saharan Africa online for the first time. So the intention with writing this book was to help people form healthy habits. But there's another reason I wrote this book, and that was that I found that I, my behavior was changing in ways that I didn't always understand and didn't always like. That somehow, sometimes products that were built to be so engaging became distracting. And so after I wrote Hooked, I remember shortly after I wrote this book, I remember you know, being fully aware of how these techniques are used, and yet when I sat down with my daughter one afternoon, to have a, some daddy-daughter time together. And I remember we had this book, this Daddy and Me book, of different activities that daddies and daughters could engage with together. And I remember this question in the book verbatim. The question was, if you could have any superpower, what superpower would you want? And I can tell you the question word for word, but I can't tell you what my daughter said. Because when she was telling me what superpower she wanted, I was busy on my device. And she got the message that whatever was on my phone was more important than she was. She left the room, and when I looked up for my phone, she was gone. She found something else to play with outside. And if I'm really honest with you, that wasn't the only time it happened. It happened on multiple occasions. Not only with my daughter, it happened when I was with friends. It would happen when I would get to my desk and say, okay, I'm definitely gonna do that hard project right now. I'm going to focus and do the thing I know I need to do right after I check email, right after I check what's going on in the news, a Slack channel, whatever, and I wouldn't do the work I knew I had to do. So if you asked me today what superpower I would want, I would tell you that I would want the power to become indistractable. Becoming indistractable is the skill of the century. The power to do our best work by focusing intently on one thing at a time will be a competitive advantage in the century ahead. And if you think the world is distracting now and you're concerned about your kids, just wait a little bit because the world is only going to become potentially more distracting. So here's the thing. This is not a new problem. Human beings have been struggling with distraction for almost as long as we have recorded history. In fact, Plato talked about akrasia, this tendency that we all have to do things against our better interests. This is not a new problem. So to understand the psychology of distraction, we need to understand this idea of why is it that we sometimes do things against our better judgment. So here's one way to think about it. If we are to understand distraction, the best way to understand distraction is to understand the opposite of distraction. The opposite of distraction is not focus. Many people think it's focus. It's not focus. The opposite of distraction is traction. Both words come from the same Latin root, trahare, which means to pull. And you'll notice both words end in the same six letters, A-C-T-I-O-N, that spells action. So traction is any action that pulls you towards what you want to do, things that you do with intent. The opposite of traction is distraction, anything that pulls you away from what you want to do, things that you don't intend to do. So this is a really important dichotomy to understand for two reasons. Number one, it frees us from this ridiculous moral hierarchy of, of, of pastimes. That you playing Candy Crush or looking at Facebook, somehow that's morally inferior to me watching football for three hours on TV. <laughs> right? Why? There is no moral hierarchy here. They're both pastimes. They're both perfectly fine if it's what you do with intent. If it's what you do, it's consistent with your values and you do it when you want to do it, it is traction. Anything that is not that is distraction. So the other reason this is a very important dichotomy is that if we don't understand the difference between traction and distraction, particularly when it comes to a business context, we let distraction trick us. You see, there's this thing called pseudo work. Pseudo work is when you sit down at your desk and you say, I am definitely going to work on that big project right now that I plan to do that I've been procrastinating. I'm going to focus here right after I check that email account, right after I just 
do a quick search on, on what's happening on in the news or Google something, because that's kind of worky stuff. I, ne I, need to, I need to go check my Slack channels, right? That feels worky. But in fact, it's pseudo work because it's not what you plan to do with your time and it is just as much of a distraction as, as watching YouTube videos or playing video games if it's not what you intended to do with your time. So my goal is not to tell you what to do with your time to, to be, be better at life. My goal is to help you do whatever it is that's consistent with your values, with your priorities to help you do those things. So now we have to ask ourselves, well, why do we do these things? Why are we led to either traction or distraction? What prompts human behavior? So human behavior is all prompted from two things, either these external triggers, which we talked about earlier in the hook model, the pings, the dings, the rings, these notifications, all the things in our environment that prompt us to action. And that action can lead us towards traction or distraction. So if your phone pings you and says, hey, it's time for that workout, it's time for that meeting, it's time for that thing you plan to do, wonderful, it's leading you towards traction. But if you get a notification on your phone as you're with your daughter and you plan to be fully present with someone you love very much, now that's leading you towards distraction. So those are the external triggers. But it turns out the most common source of distraction has nothing to do with these external triggers, has nothing to do with our technologies. The most common source of distraction are these internal triggers. Internal triggers are these uncomfortable emotional states that we seek to escape. If we want to understand distraction, we have to really start with first principles around human motivation. When you ask folks, what is the nature of human motivation? What drives us to do everything we do? Most people will tell you some version of carrots and sticks, right? This is called Freud's pleasure principle, that everything we do is about the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. We've heard this before, right? It's wrong. It's not true. That in fact, human motivation does not originate with the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain, but in fact, motivation is all about the desire to escape discomfort. It's pain all the way down. Even the pursuit of a pleasurable sensation, desire, craving, wanting. There's a reason we say love hurts because neurologically speaking, that's exactly what's going on. All human behavior is driven by a desire to escape discomfort. And so if we are to understand why we get distracted, we have to understand the source of this discomfort. That if we don't understand what we are trying to escape with, dis with these distractions, we will never get to the root source of the problem. So we have to ask ourselves, where do these uncomfortable sensations come from, right? What, what's bothering us so much? Well, there's a lot of things about the human condition that make being dissatisfied perfectly normal, okay? It's just part of being a human being these days, that we have, to some degree, a high, a, 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 a high amount of feeling uncomfortable sensations. Boredom, uncertainty, fatigue, loneliness, stress, anxiety, all of these things are perfectly normal parts of being a human being. But in order to learn to cope with this discomfort, we really have only two choices. We can either fix the source of the discomfort or learn tactics to cope with it. So for many people, when you ask folks, what is the source of their discomfort, particularly when it comes to the workplace, we know that a confluence of two factors lead to anxiety and depression disorder at work. Now, if I were to ask you what causes, what type of work environment is most likely to cause depression and anxiety disorder, what I, I would think that the answer is, you know, a depressing workplace, you know, doing a job that would be depressing, a mortician or, or a, a, a working in a slaughterhouse. No, that has nothing to do with depression and anxiety disorder created by the workplace. In fact, it's really about the type of, it's not what you do, it's the type of work environment you do it in. Turns out that the confluence of these two factors, work environments with high expectations coupled with low control, have been shown to be the kind of work environments that lead to depression and anxiety disorder. Now you need both at the same time. It's pr you can be totally fine in a work environment with high expectations and high control, that's fine. But if you have high expectations and low ability to affect change within your workplace, that's a toxic mix. And the best metaphor, has anybody seen this episode of I Love Lucy? 
this classic episode where Lucy's, you know, she gets a job at the chocolate factory, and at first the chocolates are coming down the conveyor belt at just the right pace, and she says, oh, this isn't so hard, I can wrap these chocolates, no problem, and she's doing a great job. And then her manager comes in and says, oh, wow, look, you're doing such a great job, crank it up. And she makes that, that production line go twice as fast, and now Lucy can't keep up. She's trying to wrap the chocolates as quickly as possible, so she puts them in her pockets, in her, head, in her hat, she eats them. And it's hilarious at, on I Love Lucy. It's not so funny in the real world. Because this type of work environment has been shown to be a very toxic place. And when you add into that mixed technology, you get this. This is called the cycle of responsiveness. And here's how the cycle of responsiveness works. This is why the certain work environments, literally, this isn't figurative, literally drives us crazy. And here's how it works. It starts when people come to work for the first time. And they realize, by the way, love that you're taking slides. Feel free to share them. I'm going to give you a link at the end to all the slides. <laughs> so feel free to take pictures, but you don't have to. Um, so here's how it works. People show up at work and they say, they look around and say, huh. All my managers are constantly connected. And so that means that you're, they're giving up a certain amount of control. If you want to excel here, you have to do what everybody else is doing. If they're checking email at 9 p.m. at night, you gotta check email at a night. That's part of what it takes to get ahead in this organization. And so that increases expectations while decreasing the control we have over our time to decide how we spend our time for ourselves. And so it's this toxic mix when you add technology to a dysfunctional workplace culture, this is where you get uh, this, this really terrible symptom, uh, the, uh, environment that leads to these symptoms of depression. So that's why I like to say that cultural dysfunction is the real source of distraction at work. That in fact, when companies deal with these cultural problems, not only do they solve the problem of distraction, it turns out they solve all kinds of other problems. So when companies start tackling this situation, they realize that they have all kinds of other skeletons in the closet. And they realize that, wow, if we can't talk about distraction, if we can't talk about the fact that nobody likes working nights and weekends here, then once they start talking about this discussion, they increase metrics on all kinds of different uh, ways to improve customer service, decrease employee churn. All of these ancillary benefits come from having this conversation. So one of the companies that I heard about more than any other when I did the five years of research for Indistractable, when I asked people what kind of companies do you, or what kind of products and services do you find most distracting, one of the answers was Slack. I constantly heard about Slack. Slack and email were the top two winners in terms of distracting technologies. So I decided to pay Slack a visit. And I was shocked. Does anybody here work at Slack or has worked at Slack? Nobody? No. Okay. So if you go to Slack headquarters at 6.30, you used to? Yeah. Oh, you were just waving to somebody. <laughs> okay. Hi. Come sit over here. <laughs> We've been waiting for you. <laughs> so if you were to go to Slack, you would see that at 6.30, the office is cleared out. And on nights and weekends, if you use Slack on nights and weekends, you are reprimanded. That is not what they do at Slack, which doesn't make any sense, right? You would think if Slack is the technology that is responsible for causing all this distraction, nobody uses Slack more than Slack. So they should be the most distracted people on earth. But that's not what's going on. Because Slack has these three attributes of companies that have a healthy company culture. Number one, they give people what's called psychological safety. Psychological safety made a lot of headlines a few years ago when Google did a study that found that the most productive teams were not the teams that had the quote unquote best people on the teams, not the ones with the Nobel laureates and the you know, 10x engineers. That weren't the teams that, that performed best. The teams that performed best were the ones that had psychological safety. Psychological safety means you can talk about your concerns without fear of retribution. You can raise your hand and say, hey, this isn't working out for me. Can we talk about this without fear of getting fired? And it's workplaces that give employees this sense of psychological safety that also don't struggle with this problem of distraction. Two, they give people a forum to talk about their problems. So at Slack, this is fascinating, they actually use Slack to give people a forum to talk about their problems. You go on to a Slack channel called Beef Tweets, where you post stuff that you're pissed off about the company for, to, for doing, and company management will acknowledge that they've seen your comment with emoji. They'll send you an eye icon or a check mark icon 
to let you know that they're doing something about that concern. Now, it doesn't mean that every concern needs to be fixed, right? But it means that employees feel heard. They feel like there's a forum where they can voice concerns. And third, the third attribute of companies that have this healthy workplace culture and know how to deal with distraction are companies where management exemplifies what it means to be indistractable. And this is probably the most important of the three because culture flows downhill. And so to break that cycle of responsiveness that you saw earlier, it has to be a place where management exemplifies, here's where here we value, we're the kind of workplace that values turning off and focusing during certain times of the day. Now to show you how much a company like Slack exemplifies this, this is a picture that my friend Amir sent me. This is at Slack headquarters. They literally write it on the walls, work hard and go home. Because everyone at the company understands from Stuart Butterfield on down that this is the company culture here. This is something that we value. Now, I am not calling for these blanket rules. I don't think if you want to work at a workplace where, where you're working 60 hours a week, 80 hours a week, great, do it. If you know what you're getting into, if you, you, know, if you want to go work on Wall Street or you want to start a, a startup, that's just the nature of the beast. That's fine. What I'm arguing against is this bait and switch that many companies have where you think you're going to work 40 hours a week, but then when you get there, you realize, oh, all the real work is done on nights and weekends, right? And that's, I think, where we have a problem, when there's a misalignment of expectations. And so it's by having these conversations that we can get to the real source of the problem. At the Boston Consulting Group, it's a, it's a case study in the book, they used to have a terrible workplace culture. And in fact, I used to work at Boston Consulting Group. It was my first job out of college. And I can attest, it sucked. It was horrible. Uh, around the clock type of stuff. And they actually changed the entire company with one case team. They had a challenge where they asked one case team, what would it take if everyone had one night off per week? And everybody on the case team said, no, 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 we can't do that here. We're in the client services business. We have distributed teams. We have to be always on. That's just the way we do things here. And then they said, wait a minute. You know, we're a strategy consulting firm. We're supposed to be able to figure stuff out like this. So let's say this isn't for Boston Consulting Group. This is for a client, right? Uh, Delta Airlines or IBM comes to us and says, how do we do this? Let's, let's think of it as some, we're, we're solving a problem for somebody else. So what do they do? They had these weekly meetings where they sat down together and they started talking about this problem of how can we give everyone on the team one predictable night off per week. Turns out they solved the problem in the very first week. But these meetings where they gave people psychological safety and a forum to talk about these issues let all kinds of other issues out. And now they could start talking about all the ways that they were not serving their customers as well as they could. The employee retention problem. All these issues could be discussed because people had a forum to talk about the problem. So I want you to remember it's not about the specific tactic. It's about the strategy. Tactics are what we do. Strategy is why we do it. And the strategy here is to, to ease that psychological discomfort that comes from high expectations and low control, we have to give people a sense of agency and control elsewhere. Because if you don't feel a sense of agency and control and you still have high expectations, what do you do? You're desperate for control. So what do you do? You send more emails. You call unnecessary meetings. You're on Slack channels, all psychologically to try and grasp for a sense of agency and control in your life. And this is why these internal triggers lead to more and more distraction. So if we don't get to the real source of the problem within corporations, we're never going to solve it. Because distraction is a symptom of a bigger problem. So we have to open that dialogue, try new norms, and we have to experiment on the small scale, like these small case teams of just eight people. So everything I'm gonna tell you from now on are things that you can do individually. But we do need to understand that we operate in the context of a larger environment, that sometimes the workplace itself is a source of these internal triggers which lead us to distraction. So the first step is to solve the problems we can, and culture turns out to be a problem we can solve. But there are many internal triggers we can't solve for. Right? Part of being a human being is experiencing these uncomfortable emotional states. And that part of my beef with the self-help and personal development industry is that we're constantly told that if you're not happy, you're not normal. That something's wrong with you or if you're not satisfied with your life and happy all the time, nothing can be further from the truth. 
If you think about it from an evolutionary perspective, if there was ever a group of Homo sapiens who were happy and satisfied all the time, our ancestors killed and ate them, right? It would not be evolutionarily beneficial to always be happy all the time. So our species, our natural base state is to constantly be perturbed. We always want more. And if we can channel that desire, that wanting, that craving for good, it can lead us towards traction. But if we don't know how to cope with those uncomfortable sensations, it leads us towards distraction. So if we, if we have established that all behavior is spurred by a desire to escape discomfort, that means that time management is pain management. So the very first step, the way that we start mastering these distractions and master these internal triggers is to start learning how to manage our discomfort. That the reason we turn to distractions is because we are looking for emotional pacification. And we need to learn some new techniques to deal with this distraction in a healthier manner. So let me give you a few quick wins. There's a lot in the book. I love that everybody got a book, so I don't have to sell the book because you already have it. But there's a lot more in the book that I, I just don't have time for tonight. But I want to share with you just a few techniques for how we as individuals, we don't have to wait for our company to do something necessarily. We can do something right now about this problem. Starting with simply noting the sensation. Psychologists tell us that simply writing down what it is you are feeling Preceding the distraction is a huge step towards gaining control over it. Again, we're looking for agency and control. So in the back of the book, there's what's called a distraction tracker, where all you're doing is noting the sensation. That's step one. The next step is to get curious about that sensation without getting contemptuous. Mm -hmm. Most people, when we experience a distraction, we fall into two camps. I certainly did. You either have the blamers or the shamers. The blamers say, oh, it was Facebook that did it to me. It was the iPhone that did it to me. It's the tech companies doing it to me. They're hijacking my brain. The shamers, this is what I used to do, they say, oh, you see, I'm not cut out for this. I'm not good enough. There's something wrong with me. I must have a short attention span. I must have an addictive personality. Something must be wrong with me. Those are the shamers. And of course, neither of those two answers are correct. The answer here is to get curious about the sensation, to experience whatever preceding emotion is drawing us to distraction in the first place. We can use a technique called surfing the urge. So I, this, I use this every single day. When I sit down to do my writing time, writing is really hard work. It's full of these internal triggers of boredom and anxiety, fatigue. Constantly, all I want to do is go check my phone, go check Google, go do something else for a second when I'm writing. Very hard for me to do. What I'll do when I want to get distracted, when I feel this urge to get distracted, I feel this internal trigger, I'll write down the sensation and I'll use what's called the 10 minute rule. The 10 minute rule comes out of acceptance and commitment therapy. And it says that you can give in to any distraction that you please in 10 minutes. Because we know that hard abstinence can backfire. For example, if I tell you, hey, don't think of a white bear. What are you all thinking about? Right. So if you tell yourself, don't do that, it can actually backfire. We, we ruminate on it until it feels so good to give into it that we do. Because again, about the avoidance of discomfort. So instead of saying, I, know, I, you know, I can't do that, what we instead want to do is to say, okay, I can give into that distraction, whether it's a piece of chocolate cake, whether it's doing something at work you know you shouldn't do because you wanted to do something else. You can give into that distraction in 10 minutes of surfing the urge, of just writing out that sensation. So many times I'll take out my phone and I'll say, set a timer for 10 minutes and I have two choices to make. I can either get back to the task at hand or I need to sit with that sensation for just 10 minutes. You would be amazed how often you'll just get back to that task at hand. Because these sensations, they're like waves. You wanna ride that urge, ride that wave, it'll, it'll crest and then subside. So those are just a few techniques for how we can master these internal triggers. Let's now dive into the next step for how we make time for traction. So when I was writing my book, uh, I heard from a lot of folks who complained about distraction and how difficult it is to concentrate these days. And one of my friends uh, was particularly uh, 
troubled by how distracted she was. She told me about how her kids wanted this and her boss wanted that and you see what happened in the news today and Donald Trump tweeted that and I can't get anything done because of all this distraction in the world. And I said, wow, that's, that's really tough. You know, can, can I see what it was you got distracted from? Can I see your calendar? What did you plan to do today that you didn't do? And she took out her phone and she showed me her calendar app and it was blank. There was nothing on it. Maybe a dentist appointment or something. Turns out that two-thirds of Americans do not keep a schedule. Here's the fact, folks. You cannot call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. Okay? You can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. So in this day and age, we have no choice. Because if you don't plan your day, someone else will. Down to the minute. This is a technique called time boxing. And in my research, I found that across the board, C-level executives all already did this. It's the rest of us who don't do this and really should, right? And I know it looks like a lot of work. Many of you are like, oh, that's too much work. I don't want to plan out every minute of my day. I need freedom. I, I need uh, time to do whatever I want, be spontaneous. No, sorry, too bad, okay? The price of living in 2019, you don't have to hunt your own food. You don't have to chop your own wood. You got to make a schedule, okay? <laughs> Not too much of a price to, to pay here. And what this means is not that you rigidly follow this and beat yourself up if you don't do everything on your schedule. That's not the idea here. The idea here is to have a template that you can look at so that you know the difference between traction and distraction. Traction is anything you planned to do with intent ahead of time. Anything that is not that is distraction. And where this is incredibly useful is in a workplace context. You know, so many of us as managers or people who have been managed, we've had this experience of having tasks and to-dos being lobbed over, right? I want you to do this, add this to the backlog, then do this, then do this. That's all output, okay? But we're not considering input. If you went to a baker and said, hey, I need 100 loaves of bread, the first question the baker would ask is, okay, how much flour do I have? How much uh, ingre you know, other ingredients? Where's the factory? Where's my employees? This is all I need, the inputs, to create the output of the 100 loaves of bread. But somehow with knowledge work, we just keep lobbing over this backlog of things we want people to do, and we never consider the input. The input is our time. And so what we want to do is to do what's called a schedule sync. Many of you already do this. It's called a daily stand-up if, if your schedule is changing every day. But many of us don't do this, and so what most people find is very useful is a once a week schedule sync with their colleague, where they sit down together and they say, hey, here's how I'm going to spend my time this week. Here's the things I couldn't fit on my schedule that you asked me to do, but I can't find where to put that. Help me reprioritize. Help me decide where those things go. That schedule syncing, it takes 15 minutes, will change your life. You can also do this at home. So it turns out, and this is going to be no surprise to uh, one sex in the room, one gender in the room, and maybe a surprise to the other gender in the room, that women in this country in heterosexual dual income households take on a disproportionate share of the admin duties in the home. Okay, big shocker. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened in, in my life. So my marriage, we, we've been married for almost 20 years and we used to have these fights constantly about how I wasn't pulling my weight. And I always ask my wife, I was like, look, if I'm not doing what, you, you know, what I'm supposed to do, just ask. Just tell me to do that, right? If I forgot to do something, just tell me and I'll do it. What I didn't realize is that asking her to tell me to do something was itself work. I see every, a lot of women's uh, heads nodding and no men are agreeing with me here. This is a fact of life. This is something that happens in many, many marriages. And the solution to this could not be simpler. What we're doing is a schedule sync where I sit down with my wife, it's on our schedule every Sunday night for 15 minutes, and we look at the week ahead. We divided those domestic responsibilities, not just the to-dos, but also when those to-dos are going to happen, because there's a lot of contingencies to run a household. You have to pick up the kids, then I have to cook dinner, then this has to be here. So having that schedule sync with a time box calendar will change your life. About 30 minutes of setup, 15 minutes a week to maintain. So what we're doing here is making time for traction, starting with turning our values into time. So again, I'm not here to tell you what your values should be. You should decide on what your values should be, but I want you to make sure that you are putting that time for whatever it is that you want to get done in your day 
on your calendar, whether it's taking care of your body, or whether it's uh, spending time with friends, family, whatever it is that you wanna do, meditate, take a walk, paint, it's gotta be on the calendar because if you just fill your calendar with white space, we know what we're gonna do. We're gonna check work email, we're gonna go on Slack channels, we're gonna putz around as opposed to doing what we really want to do. So the first step is to plan the time, not the output. Keeping a to-do list is step one, but keeping a to-do list without putting on your calendar is not going to get those tasks done. If it's on your to-do list, it also has to, be a, has, has to have a place on your calendar. Then what we wanna do is to get rid of low value work. The Harvard Business Review found that one day, an entire day out of every five day work week for the average knowledge worker in America was spent doing low value work. Low value work is tasks that need to get done, but not by you. Tasks that something or someone else could do. And the beauty of the age we live in is that we have all these tools to help us with these low value tasks. Let me give you a great example. Scheduling meetings. This awful ping pong game that we play going back and forth and back and forth to schedule a meeting. There are technologies like x.ai. Does anybody use x.ai? Use it. It's a fantastic tool where you're using this artificial intelligence to help book the meetings for you, just like a, a personal assistant might. Travel booking, all of these things we should not be doing. We should have, we should use technology, and today the technology is almost free, frankly, to do this low value work for us. Then what we want to do is to spend less time communicating and more time concentrating. The fact of the matter is that to do our job as knowledge workers, our job, I don't care if you're in product, if you're in marketing, if you're in dev, our job is to come up with novel solutions to hard problems. That's what we all do for a living, fundamentally. That is the definition of knowledge work. Come up with novel solutions to hard problems. But we can't do that unless we have time on our calendars to actually think. The problem is our days are consumed with everything but. The average knowledge worker spends most of their day in emails and meetings, leaving about an hour and a half for everything else. And that doesn't include, you know, basic stuff, going to the water cooler, taking a little break, whatever, all that other stuff. The only time in the day for everything else that we have to do every day, is about an hour and a half if it's not emails or meetings. And so where does work go? Where do we do the actual work of coming up with novel solutions to hard problems? You know where, after work, right? And who pays the price? Our kids, our friends, our health, that's who pays the price. And part of the reason that this is so pernicious is because all that messaging comes in the form of these external triggers, the next part of the indistractable model. There's actually one industry where mass, ma managing these external triggers is literally a matter of life and death. If I were to ask you, what's the third leading cause of death in the United States? I'll give you a clue here. Number one is heart disease. Number two is cancer. What's the third leading cause of death? If you've seen my talk, don't, if we read the book, don't tell me. What's that? Distracted, Distracted driving, accidents, Alzheimer's, stroke, not even close. If it was a disease, the third leading cause of death in the United States of America would be prescription mistakes. Doctors and nurses inside hospitals giving patients the wrong medication. Has anybody experienced this, by the way, in the room? Almost, uh, yeah, somebody, uh, almost every time I give a talk, somebody in the room will say, yep, that happened to me or my family. This happens way more than you would believe, and it's a 100% preventable human error. Most hospitals in America, they say, well, what are you gonna do? This is just a fact of life, these medication mistakes. By the way, this is not patients messing up, it's nurses or, or doctors giving patients the wrong medication. So most hospitals just say, oh, it's a fact of life, nothing we can do, until a brave group of nurses up here in UCSF decided to do something about the problem. And they wanted to figure out why this was happening. Why were nurses and doctors making so many mistakes? And it turned out that what was happening, while these nurses were dosing out medications, they were constantly distracted, on average 10 times per every medication round. So they decided to do something about the problem. What also is interesting here, from a, from a uh, metaphor perspective here, is that the nurses didn't realize they were making these mistakes until it was too late. They thought they were doing a great job. And it was only sometimes a few hours later when they realized that one of the patients was very sick or even died because of a, this prescription mistake that they realized they made an error. This happens to us every day. We think we're doing a great job, we think we're doing all right, and we don't realize how much better our work output would be, how many fewer mistakes we would make if we did our work in a concentrated, focused manner. 
So what do these nurses do about the problem? These nurses at UCSF discovered a solution to this problem that reduced prescription mistakes by 88%. 88% reduction. It wasn't some fancy new technology. It wasn't some multi-million dollar program. It was plastic vests. Plastic vests that these nurses wore that told their colleague, drug round in progress, do not disturb. 88% reduction in prescription mistakes. So what can we learn from these nurses? How can we adapt this lesson to our own lives? Well, if you open up your book, can I borrow your book for a second? Sure. Now that you all got a copy, and you go to the center of the book, you will find this. This cardstock screen sign that you can rip out of the book, fold into thirds, and put on your computer monitor to let your colleagues know that you are indistractable at the moment and you are not to be disturbed. Okay, this little screen sign. Now, what does this do for you? It sends a signal to your colleagues, please don't bother me right now. Now, I know what you're saying, but that's what headphones are for, right? I put on headphones and now everybody knows I'm not disturbed, right? Let me tell you a little secret. They think you're watching YouTube. <laughs> so we wanna send a clear, explicit signal that please don't interrupt me right now, I'm indistractable. We can also use our technology to turn off these external triggers. Anybody use do not disturb while driving mode? It's a great part of the iOS system and it doesn't have to be just used when you're driving. You can customize the message. Here's how do not disturb while driving mode works. You turn, you turn this, this function on. There's something very similar when it comes to Android phones, same idea. And anytime someone calls or texts you, they will get an auto reply that says, I can't be bothered right now. You can customize the message. Mine says I'm indistractable at the moment. If this is urgent, text me with the word urgent. And then the message will come through. Almost never comes through because, you know, pretty much everything can wait a few minutes for me to finish my focused work block. But this is a great feature that very few people actually use. It's a wonderful feature. Here's another source of external triggers. How many desktops look like this? <laughs> right? Why? We don't have to live like this anymore. By the way, my desktop used to look like this. This is a friend of mine's, but mine wasn't too far from this. We can take all that stuff, all of these distracting external triggers, which studies have found degrade our work output. All of these external triggers, we take them all, we put them in one folder called everything, and then we search for those files when we need them. We don't need all of those ex distracting external triggers. Same thing on our, on our phones. All of these notifications, these aren't helping us. We don't need that. We can have one home screen with just the most essential apps on our screen. And I tell you exactly in the book how to do this, how to make your phone indistractable in about 30 minutes. So what we wanna do is to hack back these external triggers. We know that these products and services are designed to hack our attention. That's what they're designed to do. But that doesn't mean we're powerless. We can hack back. Starting with asking ourselves this fundamental question. This is my Marie Kondo type question. <laughs> is the external trigger serving me or am I serving it? If the external trigger is serving you, if it's reminding you to do something that's an act of traction, wonderful, keep it, it's serving you. But if it's leading you towards distraction, change those stupid notification settings. Turns out two thirds of people with a smartphone never change the notification settings. Can we really call technology addictive and say it's hijacking our brains when we haven't even taken five minutes to change those stupid notification settings? Then what we wanna do is to leave these distracting devices outside of meetings, both in a work context as well as in a personal context. If we are going to have meetings in the real world, we need to be present both in body and mind. I know this is gonna ruffle some feathers. The idea here is that you have one laptop per meeting. And then you ask everyone politely to just charge their devices in the corner with a charging station. Because what tends to happen when someone in the meeting decides that I'm gonna check my email real quick, it's like a secondhand smoke effect. And everyone around them says, oh, wait a minute, I bet I have some emails too. Stirring that internal trigger, you know that feeling of, ooh, crap, I better check my email too. And pretty soon everyone's checking their devices and trying to multitask and no one is fully present in the meeting. So one laptop per meeting, project the meeting notes on a board, and if we're going to meet in person, we need to be present both in body and mind. Finally, the last step to becoming indistractable is to prevent distraction with pacts. This is the technique that we use last, okay? Word of warning here, don't do what I'm about to tell you first. It can backfire. So we have to do this only after we've done the other three. Now let me tell you all about this technique. This technique is all about making a pre-commitment. Now the first recorded case of someone using a pre-commitment goes back 2,500 years to the story of Ulysses in the Odyssey, written by Homer 
In the story, Ulysses has to sail his ship past the island of the sirens. And he knows that he's likely to get distracted. These sirens are these mythical creatures that sing this magical song, and anyone who hears the siren's song crashes their ship onto the shores of the siren's island and dies. Now, Ulysses knows this is going to happen, and he decides to do something about it. If there's one mantra I want you to remember from my book, it's that the antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. There is no temptation that we can't conquer if we plan ahead. The time to do something is not when you require a lot of willpower. If the chocolate cake is on its way to your mouth, if the cigarette is already lit, if the cell phone is by your nightstand, too late, you've already lost. The time to do something about the problem is before you get distracted. So what does Ulysses do? He tells his crew to put wax in their ears so they can't hear the siren song. And he tells them, bind me to the mast of the ship, and no matter what I do, no matter what I say, don't let me go. And you know what? It works. He sails his ship right past the island of the sirens, and he doesn't get distracted. He doesn't do something he doesn't want to do. So how can we take a lesson here from Ulysses? How can we incorporate this in our own lives? Well, we can use tech to block out tech. These are free tools. On my desktop, I use this great app called Self Control because I know when I do focused work, I'm likely to get tempted to go check Gmail for a quick minute or a Slack channel. So I have this free app, Self Control, on my desktop that blocks out those distractions. I use an app called Forest. Here's how Forest works. Whenever I do focused work, I open the Forest app, I dial in how much time I want to do focused work for, and when I push go, a little virtual tree is planted. You see that cute little virtual tree? Now, if you pick up the phone and do anything with it, that little virtual tree dies. <laughs> and you don't want to be a virtual tree murderer. So that, it's just a stupid little virtual tree, who cares, right? But it's enough of a pre-commitment to remind you, ah, this is something I don't want to do. This is a promise I made to myself that's enough of a reminder for me not to do something that I didn't intend. We can also use a focus friend. Right? So you know, in our parents' generation, if you went to work and you were reading Sports Illustrated or Vogue, everyone can tell that you're putzing around. Right? There's social proof to make you not do that kind of thing. Well, today, I can be on my laptop looking at ESPN and you don't know if I'm making sales calls or not. So what, by utilizing a focus friend, by asking a, a friend of ours to help us stay focused, we can increase our productivity. Now, if you say, oh, I work from home or I don't feel comfortable working with somebody at work, no problem. You can go to focusmate.com. And full disclosure, I love this company so much, I actually invested in it. Here's how Focusmate work. It's kind of like, remember Chat Roulette a few years ago? It's like Chat Roulette, but without all the nasty parts, okay? Here's how it works. You sign up for a time when you want to do focused work, and you are matched for free with another person who has the same objective. This was a medical school student in the Czech Republic who was studying anatomy. While I was doing something that I needed to do focus work, uh, to have my focus work time, uh, you say, hi, how you doing? Okay, go. If, ten, 10 second introduction. And then for the rest of the time, you can see them, they can see you. And it's unbelievable how much more productive you will be <laughs> when you have this pre-commitment with someone else, especially if you're the kind of person like I used to be that had trouble getting started, right? You'd say, okay, I'm going to start at 9 o'clock and do that thing I've been putting off. 9.15, 9.30, you're just going to get to it a little bit later. If you don't show up when you say you will, you're going to get a bad review on Focusmate. So it helps hold you accountable to actually show up. Very, very effective tool. So the idea here is to reduce distraction with pacts, to use tech to block out tech. But let me give you one word of warning. That this is something we have to do last, after we have made, mastered the internal triggers, after we've made time for traction, after we've hacked back the external triggers, then we prevent distraction with packs because this technique can backfire if you do it prematurely. You have to do those other steps first. The other reason it backfires is for people who haven't learned self-compassion. We know that people who are more self-compassionate are much more likely to achieve their long-term goals. So how do we become self-compassionate? We talk to ourselves the way we would talk to a good friend. If I were to tell you that I was embarrassed about that incident with my daughter, that I feel bad that I ignored her and checked my phone when I wanted to be fully present with her. If I told you that, would you tell me I'm a horrible human being, that I'm a terrible father? No, not if you were my friend, you wouldn't. 
And yet, that's the kind of self-talk that I used to say to myself. And it wasn't helpful at all. And here's what else isn't helpful. This idea that technology is addicting us, that it's hijacking our brains, that there's nothing we can do about it. In fact, it's not true. And repeating this idea makes it more true. Because when people hear that there's nothing they can do about it, that's addicting everyone, that it's hijacking our brains, it's called learned helplessness. They stop trying because they think there's nothing they can do. But that's clearly not the case. There is so much we can do. We can, make t we can master those internal triggers. We can make time for traction. We can hack back the external triggers and we can reduce distraction with pacts. So the message I want to leave with you today is that we can do this. You know, I sat down with my daughter as I was finishing up my book and I told her, I said, you know, I'm really sorry that when I first asked you this question, I didn't listen and I got distracted. So I'd like to ask you now, if you could tell me, what superpower would you want? And I expected her to tell me that she would want to fly like Superman or X-ray vision or something like that. She didn't. Here's what she said. Honest to God, here's what she said. She said she would want the power to always be kind. That's what she said. Oh. I know, right? Good so I, I, thank you. I, I dried my eyes, of course. And, and then I thought about it a little bit more and I realized, actually, being kind, that's something everyone can do. Right? You don't need to be born on some alien planet or be bitten by a radioactive spider. Anyone can be kind. And the same goes for managing distraction that we all have the power to get the best out of technology without letting it get the best of us. We all have the power to become indistractable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so I, we have time for questions. Before you go, I have a quick favor to ask. Can everybody hold up their phones for a quick second? Quick second. I want to take a picture of this. Such a great crowd. So this goes on my Instagram. Hold them high. Oh, such a good shot. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. The second reason I wanted you to hold up your phone is so that you could go take this quick survey for me. Uh, and this is a brand new talk. My book just came out last week, so it's hot off the presses. And I would love to know what you thought of the presentation. I'm still refining it based on your input. Please let me know what you thought. You can go to that QR code if you have an iPhone. If you don't, you can just go to that URL. Uh, and then when you take that short survey, it's only five questions. Would love to know what you thought. Uh, you'll be taking, you'll be given a link to my SlideShare page where you can have all the slides you just saw. And if we don't get to your questions today, feel free to go to my website nearandfar.com. Uh, there's a little contact me form there. If there's anything we didn't get to or if you want to talk offline, then please reach out. And with that, let's take some questions. I have a question about anticipation distraction. So if I'm working on something but I'm expecting like a response and it's not really like, you know, I'll get back to you and you're, and you're like, okay, <laughs> I don't know, do you put boundaries around that? Can you get back to me by 5 p.m.? Or like, how do you deal with anticipation distraction? Interesting. So first of all, you get a pin for asking the first question. Oh, thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, so, the question, so you find yourself, you ask somebody to do something, and then in the process of waiting them for the, to reply to you via email or phone call, you find you can't concentrate on the task at hand. Right. Okay, and you're, and you're asking them to reply by a certain time, or you, you're leaving it vague? Or it could be the other way. Um, I'm giving information to them and they have to review it, give a decision so I can move forward. Like, it's like this progress, mm. like, you know, trying to, I know, I'm, I know that in terms of my motivation, um, I think progress is a big factor. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, when are they gonna get back to me? Because once I have the balls now back in my court, now I can do something with it and things like that. So it's kind of like this, this weird thing that yeah. I have to figure out. Right, so I think, I mean, I, I'm not sure if there's a magical solution for that. I think it's about clear communication around, hey, look, I need this by a certain deadline or I can't move forward. Uh, and, and do you find that it's, it tends to hold you up from doing everything else in your day? Let me give more specific yeah. examples. So like when you're trying to like do a refinance loan or something like that and your <laughs> documents are going to underwriting uh -huh. and they are like coming back, it's a back and forth, it's a dance, right? right. And, and you're like, but I gave you all these documents and then they come back, oh, we want to see this, oh, we want to see that. And it's like, okay. And you're like, when is this loan going to close or something? That's where I was like, 
I can't really do anything. When when is my um, you know agent going to call me back and say I'm going to need this now? I have to go find these documents and things like that. And I found myself really like stuck. Like I see. Yeah. And so, do you, do you work on one loan at a time, or do you have a portfolio of different things no, you could be doing? No, this is just my own personal. Like I ah. was, yeah. So okay. I was, I was the one wanting. So you to could be doing something else, but you found it difficult to concentrate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So this is a perfect example of how an internal trigger leads us to distraction. So it wasn't the it wasn't the actual case that the process. You know, I, I thought what was going on is I need you to do this, or I can't proceed. You you could work on other stuff. What was happening is was the anxiety of is this going to happen, what's going to happen next, the feeling was preventing you from doing other things that you could do to be productive. So the idea here is to focus on that, is to understand actually this isn't really the case that I can't move forward, it's a sensation I seek to escape. And so using techniques like that 10 minute rule, like surfing the urge, like understanding, okay, I'm feeling anxious right now because I feel, you know, this is what it takes to deliver good client service is caring deeply about my client and I want to get this done for them as quickly as possible. But this is just a feeling. It's not a fact. You know, you don't want to believe everything you feel. And so by understanding this is just a sensation that will crest and pass, you can get back to the task at hand. But by recognizing that the real problem is not the situation, the real problem is your reaction to the situation. Is that helpful? I have to move on that. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you for such an awesome talk. And sure. Thank God I came to the talk today. I was almost going to miss it. <laughs> uh, so the question I have is, um, you know, we work in very demanding sort of jobs, especially Silicon Valley. And, you know, there's teams in India, maybe in other parts of the country. Mm -hmm different time zones, right? And so they do tend to creep up in, in your own personal space sometimes, most of the times actually. How do you like, you know, set very clear expectations like with your boss, like, okay, you send me an email at 11 p.m. in the night, don't expect a response in 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is where it comes down to having that conversation, that I can teach you all the techniques to becoming indistractable. You can m master the internal triggers, make time for traction, hack back external triggers, and prevent distraction with packs. But if your, call, if your boss decides to call you at 7 p.m. on a Friday night, what do you do? You have to respond because your livelihood depends on it. But is it the telephone your boss used to, to tell you to do the, the project, to tell you to do the task that's at fault? Or is it your annoying boss? I think it's your crappy boss. <laughs> and so this is where culture comes into play, where we need to have these conversations. The problem is not the fact that technology is connecting us in these new ways. The problem is that we don't have an open dialogue to talk about these problems. And again, I'm not advocating for saying, oh, never work for a job that requires you to work more than 40 hours a week. Like, we need to know what we're getting into, right? If you, uh, if you have allergies, you probably shouldn't be a forest ranger. It's just, you know, part of, the, part of being at certain companies is that you're going to work a lot of hours. But it's when we don't realize what we're getting into. That's where the bait and switch occurs. So when we get hired and we say, oh, yeah, I'm going to take this job, and then we get there and we realize, actually, it's not a 40-hour week job, it's an 80-hour week job, and we're always demanding, we're always, we always have to be on, that's the kind of work environment where people have high expectations and low control and burn out. And so it behooves you and your boss to have that conversation. Unfortunately, it's not something you can snap your fingers and change someone's mind. So a few solutions. One, become indistractable yourself. Do everything that you can do as an individual first, before you expect others to change. So for example, keeping that time box calendar and saying, hey, look, boss, here's how I'm planning my time. I read this great book, Indistractable. You should check it out too, boss. <laughs> and saying, here's how I plan my day. Now, if I don't get focused work time in, I can't do my best work for you. So I need that time. Where would be a convenient time for me to get in an hour and a half of focused work? What do you think? And having that conversation, having that dialogue, it's not about the specific solution. It's about the strategy of opening a dialogue around the importance of focused work. And so you might have time where you say, look, I'm going to do tasks that are only reactive tasks, uh, answering emails, Slack channels, being open to reactive work, and that time should be on your calendar. But then you also need time for reflective work. If all you're doing all day long is reacting, you have no time for reflection. And that's, I think that's something that most bosses hopefully will understand. Yeah, sure thing. Yeah.
Uh, my question actually branches off of that one, yeah. which is bringing it into your personal life. Um, how do you have those conversations with people who don't understand the same need for traction and mm -hmm. they're just satisfied in, in their constant um, distraction or non-planning? Give me an example of a, a situation. So if I have personal goals and I want to work on on, on the side, but yet friends or colleagues will want to do things last minute and discuss mm. last minute um, and not have the same type of structure in their life. Yeah. So yeah. How, how do we help them understand our structure? That's fantastic. So this is where schedule syncing really comes in handy. Um, so we can do that with our significant others. We can sit down like I do with my wife and say, hey, here's my schedule for the week ahead. Here's where I have time for you. Here's where I have time for my daughter. Here's where I have time for domestic responsibilities. Where I have time to cook for the week. All that stuff. Here's where it is. I'm getting, you know, here's, this is where we're synchronizing our time together. And it also comes, I think, I, I think that there's a, a, a real, well, it's not I think, I know, there's a crisis in this country with loneliness. We've seen these numbers are staggering. So people have fewer friends in this country than they ever had before. This started in the 1990s. It wasn't something that technology did. You know, if you've read Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone, what's happened is over the past several decades is that civic organizations have disintegrated. So fewer people are going to church. Fewer people are uh, participating in Kiwanis and uh, uh, Rotary Club and bowling leagues. And this has been documented for decades now, which means that we are lonelier than ever. And psychologists tell us that loneliness is as detrimental to our health as smoking and obesity. So this is a real epidemic. And part of the reason is, is that we don't have the regularity that civic groups used to provide. It's not about the church or the synagogue or the mosque or the temple. It's about the fact that it always occurred on the same time and place. And you would go there and see people who cared about you and who you cared about in your community. And so with that disintegration, we have lost something. And so what we have to do is bring back regularly scheduled friendships. And so part of how we do that, uh, that I advise in the book, is called the kibbutz. And I just made up that term, kibbutz. And he, I was born in Israel, I left when I was three years old, but uh, kibbutz means gathering. And on what we did with this group of, of friends, it was, it was four couples here in Silicon Valley, and we planned same time, same place, every two weeks we would get together. Kids were invited, but they could not interrupt because kids can be a source of distraction just as much as technology can. So the rule was, unless someone's bleeding, you can't interrupt us. Go play. And we had time to form adult friendships. People, and so every week we would go around th this group uh, of these eight adults, these four couples, and everyone would have their turn. And some people would talk about, okay, this is what's happening for me at work. Uh, here's something I'm struggling with in terms of how to raise our kids. I'm having you know, a conflict with my parents that I don't know how to resolve. And it was, it was unbelievable. We got so close to each other. It wasn't you know, sports, politics, and weather. More stupid small chalk. That doesn't make you feel closer to anyone. But it was the regularity that mattered. We knew we would always be there, same time, same place. You brought your own food, no preparation needed. And having that on the schedule was the best chicken soup for the soul. Right, having that on your schedule. So I, I would say, look, we can do this, to your friends perhaps, we can do the spontaneous stuff on the fly, when it happens. But if we don't plan, it's not gonna happen. So in addition to the spontaneous stuff, I really value our relationship. Can we have time on the calendar forever and ever, every third Tuesday, you know, every second Monday, whatever it's gonna be, I want that time with you because I really care about you. And then yes, if the spontaneous stuff happens, we'll plan that, you know, that, that'll fall into place if it happens. But the fact is the spontaneous stuff tends not to happen because it gets crowded out. The kid's sick, the work is busy, travel arrangements. So if we don't plan to make it happen, it probably won't. Good? Yeah, sure. During focus work, sometimes um, I get interrupted. How do you recover quickly from interruptions? What I find is if I have to do that rapid context shift when I'm deep in thinking, I, it takes me about half an hour or more to get back to where I was before I was interrupted. Yes. Okay, terrific question. So on that distraction tracker that's on the, the, uh, in the back of your book, there are three types, there's only three reasons for every distraction. Only three reasons. It's an external trigger, it's an internal trigger, or it's a planning problem. That's it, only three reasons for every single distraction. 
So what you want to do, the idea here is not to beat yourself up if you get distracted. The idea here is to note, the, note why you got distracted. Was it an internal trigger that you couldn't cope with whatever uh, internal state you, you, you dealt with in an unhealthy manner as opposed to dealing it through traction, you dealt with it through distraction? Was it an external trigger, a ping, a ding, a ring, a colleague, something interrupted you? Or was it a planning problem? You expected that checking email would take you an hour, or took you an hour and a half. And then what you're going to do after the session, after the session, you're going to figure out ways to fix your calendar the next go around, right? So you're going to ask yourself, how do I make sure that I have a tool in my, in my uh, war chest for dealing with that internal trigger in a healthier manner? How can I make sure that I don't get interrupted by that external trigger next time? How do I make sure that, hey, I, if I didn't allot, allot enough time for this task today, how do I make sure I allot enough time for it the next go around? So what you're doing is you're iterating on this because you know there's that famous quote that's attributed to Einstein but he never said it which is that insanity is defined as doing the same thing again and again and expecting different results. We keep getting distracted by this shit all the time and we don't do anything about it. <laughs> and so the idea here is to recognize what's going on and take steps proactively to make sure it doesn't happen again in the future. It sounds like there was one particular distraction. When I said the three types, you nodded your head for external triggers. I set my desk and everything to do not disturb or focus time, but there are colleagues who will say, I just have one quick question. Yes. And that kills me every time. Yes. And they physically come up to you or they're doing it over Slack channels? No, they physically come up to you. Physical. Okay. So you, you, you take the screen sign and you make sure. <laughs> so it's pretty explicit. You'll see, like when you put that screen sign and you give them the stink eye, uh, it, it, it sets this precedence, right? And, and it's a good thing to open the conversation around. I don't know if I would you know, expect them to see it the first time, but you might say, hey, look, I read this book. I'm trying to become indistractable here. So when you see this sign, this means I'm doing something that I, in order to do the task, I really need to focus. So I'm gonna put up this little sign. And that opens the dialogue, that opens this little conversation. And so that would be my first tip. You, you would be surprised how, do you work in an open floor plan office? Yeah, yeah okay, so those open floor plan offices, they save companies tons of money because they don't have to give us all offices, but this is the cost, is this constant distraction. So this, this is what I'm hoping that the screen sign can, can help with. So try it out, let me know how it goes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, quick question. How do you help teenager with you know, uh, distraction? Ah, I was waiting for this question. Okay, so there is a section in the book called How to Raise an Indistractable Child. And this was the section of the book that I think uh, most surprised me when I dove into the research. I didn't realize what's really going on with our kids today. So there are lots of practical things you can do, which I'll tell you, it, you'll, you'll read the book later, you have the book, in terms of step by step what you can do to help your kid learn this skill. But here's the thing I think we miss uh, that's very important. So when I did this research around the first step of mastering the internal triggers, that if we all know that the reason we get distracted is because of these internal uncomfortable states, we have to ask ourselves, what's going on with our kids? What are they looking for? What are they finding escape from exactly? And so I came across the work of Desi and Ryan. Uh, these are two psychologists that established self-determination theory. Self-determination theory is the most widely accepted and studied theory of human motivation. It says that all human beings for psychological flourishing require three things. Competency, autonomy, and relatedness. If you've read the book Drive by Dan Pink, he calls them different things, but he's quoting Desi and Ryan. So mastery, autonomy, and relatedness. These are three things that we have to have. It's called psycho, uh, what I call psychological nutrients. So you know how you have carbohydrates, protein, and fat for physical nutrients, the macronutrients? For psychological nutrients, we need competency, autonomy, and relatedness. So let's talk about these three things when it comes to our kids. Competency. One thing that has risen in this country since around 2008, along with the fact that more kids have access to technology, is also the fact that this rise of no child left behind, which has mandated that teachers teach towards the test, standardized tests. And so if you look across this country, what's happening is that kids receive, are, are mandated to do more standardized testing than ever before. And so this has created a subclass of kids who are constantly told, you are not competent. And what do people do when they don't feel competent in the real world? They go to the online world, where the companies like you know, Minecraft and uh, uh, Fortnite, these games make people feel competent. You're the god of this universe. You feel good because you are competent. You can change what's going on in this environment. It feels good. Then we have autonomy. We know that freedom 
and agency is absolutely critical for psychological flourishing. And yet, we also know that in this country, Peter Gray did this study that found that the average American child has twice as many restrictions placed upon them as an adult, I'm sorry, 10 times as many restrictions placed upon them as an adult, twice as many as a convicted incarcerated felon. There are only two places in society where we are allowed to tell people where to go, how to dress, what to think, who to be friends with, what to eat, and that's school and prison. And so is it any surprise when we regulate our kids' lives so tightly all day long that when they come home, they want freedom, they want agency, they want control. And so, of course, they go to these online environments where they feel like God. They're free in these online worlds. And then finally, relatedness. One thing that has happened over the past 50 years is a collapse in the number of hours that kids spend in free play. Free play is defined as time that kids have with each other without the supervision of, a, of parents and coaches. So what's happened in this country is that, you know, when I was a kid, the, the neighborhoods of, of my neighborhood sang with the sound of kids playing. And you don't hear that anymore because rich parents schedule the hell out of their kids. Between Kumon and Mandarin and swimming lessons and piano, there's no time for free play. And this is why we are raising a, a generation of incredibly fragile kids. Because kids need play. Play is where we learn our place in the world. It's one thing when a parent tells you what to do. It's a whole other story when one of your friends says, hey, if you're a jerk to me, I'm not going to play with you. That's where we learn our place in the world. Play is the most psychologically beneficial thing you can give your kid. But we don't make time for it. So rich parents overschedule their kids. People who are not as affluent keep their kids behind lock and key. Why? Because the media tells us stranger danger and abductions and scares the crap out of everyone, even though this is the safest time in history to be a child in this country. So the answer is to really understand why our kids overuse technology, we have to understand what they are escaping from. And so that's what Destiny and Ryan's knee displacement hypothesis says, that when kids don't get their psychological nutrients met offline, they look for these nutrients online. And that's where we have to start. That's the real source of the problem, not just the proximal cause of the problem. You are there hooked now for your book? <laughs> yeah, so again, I, I don't, you know, I, I, I didn't make these products. <laughs> None of us did. They're not anybody's fault, but there are our responsibility. These products are not going away. So it turns out there's some simple things we can do. Right? So one is understand what's going on in their life. Understand the psychology behind what they're looking to escape. Two, make time for traction. Give them time in their day to, to use these technologies. So when my daughter was five years old, we sat down with her and we said, hey, how much screen time do you want? Okay? It's not melting your brain. It turns out there is zero studies, zero evidence that shows that two hours or less of age appropriate screen time has any negative effects on children. Where you start seeing negative effects is either very young, two or less, the American uh, Pediatric Association says two, two years old or less, they shouldn't have access to screens. Where we start seeing a lot of, some uh, small effect in terms of, of negative effects is four, five, six hours a day. That's where you start seeing negative effects of screen time. Two hours or less, no negative effects. Not any studies have shown this. What we, so, so what I, we did with my daughter is we said, look, how much time do you want to spend with screens? And she said, two episodes. She thought she was getting a deal. <laughs> she said two episodes. Two episodes on Netflix is 45 minutes. Fine. But here's the deal. You have to enforce that time, not me. So how are you, and five years old, how are you going to make sure that you don't spend more than 45 minutes enforcing this rule that you set to yourself? So we used to have a micro microwave that was below the countertop, and she would go to the microwave and she said, well, I can program this microwave 4500 start, and that would tell me when it's time to stop using the screen. Now she actually, inside the Apple iOS, comes screen time. So she can use the tools to moderate herself. So it's not daddy saying, get off that screen. I'm supporting her sense of agency and autonomy by helping her learn to enforce her own rules. And so now I'm not the bad guy. The technology tells her to turn it off, <laughs> right? And that's a skill that she's going to carry. You know, the goal of, of, of raising a kid is not raising a kid, it's raising a future adult. So I want her to be able to have this skill even when she's outside the home. So that's how we make time for traction. We can hack back the external triggers. So kids do not need devices in their rooms. Anything that interrupts sleep, this is what's really going on with our kids. It's not the technology that's causing these mental health issues. It's the fact that they're not getting enough sleep that's causing the mental health issues. 
So we need to make sure that there are no triggers in the bedroom. Anything that pings or dings at night, whether it's the computer, the laptop, the iPad, or the good old television, not in their bedrooms. It needs to be in public space. And then we can prevent distraction with packs. Teach your kids how to use these devices in a way that they can make sure that they can get the best out of them. So how do you know a kid is ready for technology? Do they know how to turn it off? When it's time for dinner, can they put away their phone? When it's time to do their homework, do they know how to use Do Not Disturb? Can they use apps like Forest? You know, if they can't, they're not ready for the device. Just like you, you know, pools are very dangerous for children. A lot of kids drown in swimming pools. But we don't keep our kids out of swimming pools, we teach them how to swim. And that's exactly what we have to do with our technology. Thank you so much. Sure. Tell me when, by the way, I don't want to keep people longer. Oh, yeah, sure. I, uh, Nick? Over here. Yeah. Hi. Um, I have a question for a manager, or being a manager in your sure. face. So you have a lot of things happening left and right, no matter how much you prep Sunday or Monday. Um, based on what we've, sorry, based on what we've been talking about, so that you're not part of the problem with your team, how can you better route those tasks in such a way that they get dealt with? Because on the one hand, either you're a management 2.0 trying to deal with it for your team, or on the other hand, you're just sort of watching them queue up about to drop on your team to deal with. And I feel like that's a major distraction in holding them back from realizing their focus time. So you're saying you have a, a focus day planned, so people have time boxed their day, and then there's some kind of fire drill that happens? Yeah, exactly. And I didn't find this in the beginning when we were a startup, but I do find it now in growth. Mm. Is there's just so many inputs that are just hitting you from all sides, mm -hmm. and it uh, does feel a little bit chaotic. And I'm trying to not be part of the problem, um, you know, in terms of just dumping. As soon as something comes in, dishing it out, and I'd rather queue it up and give it to them in a structured fashion. Right. But it doesn't always happen. Basically, I end up with the burden of that and trying to administrate that myself. Right. So the answer is buffer time. So if you have an event that is predictable, you know exactly how much time to spend. So if you say, I need to spend an hour, uh, I want to move, the, you know, work on this presentation for one hour, I'm, I have to give a presentation in a month, I'm going to work on it one hour every day until I finish the presentation at the end of the month, that's predictable. I'm going to work on it one hour every single day. Some things are less predictable. So on your time box calendar, you should have time for commuting. But if you drive in traffic, sometimes the traffic's bad, sometimes the traffic's not so bad. And so the answer is you build in buffer time. So what you do is you put time in your calendar every day. If you find, you know, 50% of the time, something will come up from, come down from upper management that takes me by surprise, well then you're building in buffer time for your team. You're building in maybe an hour of, hey, it might not come today, it might come tomorrow, we're not really sure, but we want to build that buffer time just in case, because there's a high probability that something unpredictable might happen. Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. We'll take the last question now, and then go ahead. Where's yeah. That? Okay. Cool. Oh. Hi there. Um, you were talking about relationships before and how they're like uh, soup to the soul, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, I actually think that a lot of uh, being able to uh, get outside of your head is being in those relationships and then support you. There was a promise in online and social media to get there to kind of uh, connect with your old friends from high school and stuff like that. Do you think there is uh, still a way for the online to uh, give you those relationships that you need in life? Mm. Or, it, or online will never get there? I think that uh, social media is an addition, not a substitution. Uh, there are so many people that I would not be able to stay in touch with were not for social media. So many people, so many relationships I would have never made were not for social media. But I don't think it's a substitute for face-to-face. -face. You know, having a dinner party, sitting down with those kibbutz friends, and bearing your soul in person, and seeing their reaction face-to-face, -face, I think that's special and unique. Uh, and I don't, I think it's too high of a bar to, to ask, necessarily. Uh, I think that, the, you know, being disappointed that a technology can't make it perfect is, is too high of a bar, right? Every, you know, it's good for what it's good for. It's good for keeping in touch with friends at a distance, but it's much better than losing contact altogether. One thing, speaking of kids, it's amazing how technology today, you know, when, when we grew up, uh, you, I had a notebook with all my friends' phone numbers, and then when everybody moved out of their house, this was before cell phones, I lost touch with all of them. I don't, I don't know my childhood friends anymore. My nieces and nephews, they're keeping in touch with all their friends because now they have an identity that follows them throughout life. So their kindergarten friends are still their friends because now they, they can keep in touch in ways we never could. 
So I think there's a lot of benefits to these things um, that I, I wouldn't say it's better or worse, it's different. All right, great, Deer, thank you so yeah, much for the pleasure. talk. Thank you. Thank you.